Good morning. This is the JP Dunnell Podcast YouTube exclusive. I am JP Dunnell and I have Lucas. What's up, buddy? What's going on, man? How are you? I'm good. What you got? Uh, you tell got me if I've asked questions, this question. I might have answers. Yeah, tell me if I've <laughs> asked this question before. Which arm is your bruiser arm? <laughs> 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 my my goal right now with that is just to see how offsides I could get you. So mission accomplished. Nice. Uh, here you go. Uh, is there a way to practice having difficult conversations? I'm not exactly known for my tact and or delicacy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having difficult conversations like anything we do in life is a skill set. Yep. So we teach at Echelon Front how to have hard conversations through our framework, which is identify the problem, take ownership, explain the consequences, provide a solution. And that's a very loose um, outline of that. And, you know, that's what we do with our clients during our half day and full day workshops. Yeah. We teach it at the muster. We role play it. We role play through it. So the, the biggest takeaway that I would pass on to some to somebody right now, since we can't do an actual back and forth role play is frame out the conversation that you want to have with this person mm -hmm. where you're able to talk through the problem and the consequences and then make sure you're taking ownership. It's really easy to have good tone, tact, and delivery when you're taking ownership. This is a problem that you're a part of. This is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and then providing that solution, um, you know, from a, um, from a posture and he, here's the thing, your intent has to be true and good. If you have ill intent, people are going to recognize that. And now you just lost all credibility. Yeah. If you're just like, well, I'll just put on a game face for this conversation. Well, no, they're going to see that they're going to hear it. They're going to feel it. So your intent has to be pure and good that you want to solve the problem that you feel like you are responsible and that you're going to help solve the problem. So when you're running through all those and you're providing the solution, the solution has to be genuine from a standpoint of like, hey, you're wanting to help solve this problem that you created. And also, if you have the opportunity to give them ownership over a solution that they need to implement, that's the best way to do that is because it's like, hey, there's a problem going on. The team, you know, the team is whatever, right? Whatever. They didn't hit their numbers. And okay. okay, so you're identifying the problem that they, you know, hey, you didn't hit your numbers. Here's how it impacts, you know, the organization from a standpoint from, you know, our goals and our metrics. It also has a negative impact on your guys's compensation plan. Hey, that's my fault that I wasn't uh, communicating with you guys more regularly to have an idea of where we're at, where we're tracking. I didn't provide you guys enough support in regards to the tools and the resources that you need to go out and, and hit your numbers. So, hey, moving forward, instead of us meeting once a month, I'm gonna start meeting with you guys once a week to have a better idea of where we are tracking in regards to our numbers. Is that something that would be able to help you guys out? This once a month, I'm sorry, is once a week enough? Is that too much? Is it not enough? What works for you so that I can do a better job supporting you guys moving forward to make yeah. sure we stay on track? And so I'm going to frame that out. And you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to write it down. And since you guys are watching on YouTube, you can see what I have. I have a little notebook in front of me. Yeah, a rainproof notebook. Yeah, right in the rain. You know, it's the notebooks that we give out at the FTXs because this is what we use in the SEAL teams. Yeah. And um, anyways... I'm going to, I'm going to write down the talking points of my conversation so that I stay on track. I can hit my points. It's a reminder of what I need to talk about. I'm going to write in all caps. It's my fault. And then put in parentheses, take ownership to make sure I don't forget to put that point in there. Right. Because if there's something wrong on my team or in my organization or in my family, it is my responsibility. And it is my responsibility to provide a solution to that problem. And I'm going to be genuine with that because I believe that, that it is my responsibility. I'm going to take ownership and I'm going to help solve that problem. So you need to frame out the conversation. You need to prepare it and then role play it, role play it with a spouse, a coworker, a friend, a buddy to say, Hey man, do you, do you have five minutes to help me out? I need to have this hard conversation. I want to make sure that my tone is correct. I want to make sure that I'm not coming off rude. Uh, hey, I screwed some things up. I need to have a hard conversation. You know, could you help me out? Most people that you reach out to are going to be able to give you five to seven minutes. And then you role play that conversation with them. And then you ask them to say, hey, for this first iteration, I want you to be offended. I want you to be rude. I want you to push back. And then that way you can kind of 
figure out how to overcome those objectives. And then when somebody is rude and, and, and disrespectful and unprofessional and pushing back, you can learn to protect, I'm sorry, to control your emotions to protect that relationship. Yeah. Because if, if I, I, if I go to have a conversation with you and I'm trying to take ownership and I'm addressing a problem and, and, and course correcting things and you're offended and you say something rude to me and it, I lose my temper and or like snap back at you. Well, guess what? Now I've, ruin that relationship and I right. put ourselves even farther back. So it is a skill set. You have to be professional enough to prepare for it, rehearse it, re role play it, write it out. You know, it's the same thing that we suggested people like, Hey, if you get a scathing email or an email that's attacking you or something that frustrates you and you're having to respond in an email, type it up and then print it off and read it out loud before you hit send. Because the time that it's going to take for you to print it off and now read it out, guess what you're naturally going to do? You're going to detach. And you're going yeah. to be able to read that email and be like, oh, oh <clears throat> I'm going to take that sentence out. Hey, maybe I'm going <laughs> to... A little too fired up here. Yeah, maybe yeah. I'm not going to have all caps on this email. Maybe I'm not going to reply all and then CC all of my friends and bosses. Maybe I'm going to take a different approach and I'm going to call them. Right. And say, hey, I just got your email. There's obviously a problem that I created. I'm sorry that you're upset. Is there, can I come to your office? Or, hey, can we jump on Zoom? Or, hey, can we jump on Teams to, to talk through this face to face? Yeah. Because I know that's going to be the best situation. If I can actually sit down and have a face to face conversation and apply these principles, th there's going to be an outcome that we all want. So, when, when you do the email, you write it out and you read it. Um, do you ever do that with like the the conversation that you know you need to have that's got to be like a, a conversation? I know Jocko has talked about before that there were times where he like typed out what he needed to say to somebody and might like have the bullet points on his screen while the person was sitting across the desk for him to make sure that he kept, he yeah, kept same, his, thought, same thing. his thoughts in yeah. order. Yeah, so you, but you, you would suggest even doing some of those things like when you have to have a sit down conversation with somebody to keep your, your thoughts in line every single time. Really? Yeah. Okay. Unless you've mastered communication and you always deliver your points perfect every single time and you don't miss your points, you don't add points that you don't need, then I would probably. Oh, that. so I don't need to do it then. So you're probably good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. All right, yeah. man. Cool. Yeah. I think we nailed that one. I think it's a great talking point too. So yeah. All right. You want to do a, another one for this one or. Because I got it. I got another. I got a short one. Sure. If you want to answer a short one, cool. All right. Uh, what is your favorite type of knife to carry? Mm, I mean, I love um, the half face blade. Um, just all. <laughs> I, mean, I love all, all, all their stuff. Is super yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, Bruiser Arms has a nice little half face blade mm -hmm. that Leif gave me. I've seen pictures um, of it. Yeah, I thought I'd shown you in person. No? no, okay, I'll bring it next time. You're always never it's, showing me cool stuff in person. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> I love it because it's like this perfect little compact size where it's a straight edge. You can put it in your pocket. You can put it on your belt. You can easily conceal it, but it's gonna get the work done. Yeah, it's on one of your. If you want to see it, you can go to JP's Instagram. It's on his Bruiser Arms story. That's just like yeah, up at the top. Yeah, it's I love that. And then um I also have That's super cool. One of the cabinet folders. Yeah. Yeah. And so I like that little little sticker. Yeah. I I go back and forth between the fixed blade and the folding knife. Mm -hmm. Like same. The I like the practicality of the fixed blade because it can do anything. It's just there are times when a fixed blade knife is difficult to just have on your person. The folder is so much more convenient to just have something yeah, that's like yeah, on your it's pocket, in or, your pocket, or on your fanny pack, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But there, Kirsten got me the uh, the Vertex, the Sock P fanny pack. Mm. So there's some webbing on the back of it, so I can take those Kydex mm. uh, sheaths and mm. stick them on there. Problem is that uh, when you're doing that blind and you got to put something back in, the stabby part of the knife. It will find the fleshy part of your hand if your yeah. aim isn't really good. Yeah, you got to find touch points with a, a knife when you're putting I, a knife I, back in. I found in. a touch point, the bone and this pointer finger. Yeah, whatever. that's not the <laughs> ideal stick. touch point that yeah. you want. You want, yeah, yeah. All right, it's, rock on. It's, hey, it's a rush to get the knife out, never to put it away. That's true. So why would you? I mean, take your time putting your knife away, just like putting your gun away. It's a rush to get the gun out, never to put it away. 
It's a good point. So I, that's, I've never heard that talk, before. We but can, that that we, makes a lot of let's sense. Let's talk about that on the next one. Yeah. So because I break that down when I teach shooting and I talk to people about it, it's the stupidest thing to rush to put your put your gun or knife away. Yeah. There's no reason unless you're transitioning, but oh, still. Yeah. That's a different thing. Yes. Yep. All right. All right. So we appreciate you guys uh, joining us on this YouTube exclusive Q&A. Uh, appreciate all the support that you guys give us, as always, with the podcast for just being subscribed, for the commenting, the liking, the sharing. You guys sharing these things on social media is always awesome. So appreciate we you. hope that you guys have an awesome week and go out there, do the work, and to never settle.